So Madfest, please give it up for the original, original thinker, Rory Sutherland. Hello. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm not very far away, but it's very good to be speaking to you anyway. And what I'd just like to say is there's a very simple lesson we learned uh, through our use of uh, digital technology during lockdown, which is a much, much more important wider lesson to learn for everything we do in marketing. And quite simply, we learned with video conferencing that quite often there are things which don't make sense individually, which do make sense collectively. And this is a really important lesson, I think, in any complex system, that you don't optimize an overall system by the optimization of individual components. So in 2018, suggesting you did something by video conferencing um, was what I call a Dr. Pepper decision. It was an eccentric decision. You were likely to get heavily blamed if anything went wrong. By contrast, flying out to Frankfurt to meet Jürgen for two hours was a Coca-Cola decision. That was the natural default. If anything went wrong, people blamed the airlines or they blamed fog or they blamed you know, air traffic control strikes over France. You didn't get the blame. And this is, by the way, very, very common with network technologies, that network technologies that work at scale often work very badly at small scale. So just to give an example, uh, a perfect example, in fact, you know, there's no value in having the world's only fax machine. If there are only 10 fax machines in the world, the value is pretty limited. The value is only delivered when you reach a certain scale. And that distinction between what's rational at small scale in the short term and what's rational at a large scale over the longer term is something I think businesses often fail to make because we're so obsessed with looking at spreadsheets and quantifying everything that effectively we treat smaller and smaller parts of the business as an individual standalone optimization problem and we optimize locally and we give too little thought for what's actually optimal collectively and i'll give you a very interesting example of this uh, just for just as an interesting parallel by the way for those of you who are old enough to remember what a fax machine was um, the fax machine was, in fact, technologically possible in the 19th century, and they existed in very small quantities throughout the beginning of the 20th century. It was strangely, rather like a pandemic, it was a series of postal strikes in the UK that really propelled the fax machine to universal adoption. It was actually an external, simultaneous shock that actually drove a technology to uh, what you might call uh, practical widespread adoption to a point where it can genuinely deliver its benefits. And here's something I think we've also missed as marketers, which is the whole question about flexible working, which is we're asking the question, does it work for my team? Does it work for my company? You know, how can I make it work if three of my members of staff decamp to uh, Yorkshire, for example? But there's a bigger question to be asked, which I think everybody's missed. And I'm just going to mention this as a provocation, which is what does it mean for the economy as a whole if more people can work flexibly? And my argument is, as a marketer, surely this is extraordinarily good news. If you live in London at the moment, if we give a pay rise to somebody, one of our members of staff in London, after tax, about 50% of the increment will end up getting soaked up by transportation costs and accommodation costs. Now, thought about very broadly, the raw material of marketing is discretionary income. Economists don't really look at this. They don't understand this distinction very well, because according to economists, you spend money to maximize your own utility, and therefore every act of expenditure is a voluntary act. But if you take a realistic view of the world, that patently isn't true. OK, you know, you know, you're forced to live somewhere reasonably close to your work. If you're in a dual income household, you've got an even bigger problem because you have to live somewhere where both of you can get to work fairly, fairly easily. And therefore, the places in which you can live in order to earn a reasonably remunerative salary are incredibly limited. So most of the gains of your work, I'm a Georgist secretly, most of the gains of your work don't actually end up in the pockets of the person who does the work. They end up in the pockets of landowners.
And my argument to Mark Reed was we should not only adopt flexible working, we should widely promote it for the simple reason, I said, that unless our clients are, one, the Duke of Westminster, two, Transport for London, or three, Southeastern Trains, everybody else stands to benefit if people can spend more money on things they choose and less money on things that were previously obligations. Now, it strikes me that a widespread adoption of flexible working in the UK, not even counting the environmental benefits, which are hardly irrelevant, could be equivalent in terms of disposable income to something like a nationwide 10% reduction in the tax rate, in terms of the amount of money that people have to spare. Does this seem crazy? I've asked polls of people on Twitter. Most people agree with me. If you look at it in another terrifying way, at the moment, if, if commercial rents take a hit, and if buy-to-let landlords take a hit, and if the Duke of Westminster takes a hit, um, to be honest, it should be good news for the productive economy. At the moment, 80% of bank lending goes towards some form of real estate. Now, real estate is a rivalrous economy. It's not a productive economy. If someone buys an electric car, yes, they're getting an electric car for themselves, but they're also funding lower prices and better quality of electric cars for everybody else. If you buy a house, you get a house and you deprive somebody else of that house. There's no other wider benefit. And so it strikes me that there's an opportunity with flexible working to shift an enormous amount of money from the obligation economy to the discretionary economy. And at larger scale, regardless of what we think about it with our own individual teams, or our own individual work, we should be actually promoting and evangelizing this. But I'll come to another point, which is this question of what is rational in the short term with a limited number of metrics, okay, at small scale may not be rational collectively. And I'm gonna call this the Walford paradox of digital marketing. And it strikes me that no one's noticed this and we need to talk about it a lot more. Now, every week I spend on online grocery deliveries, you know, a hundred pounds or so for a family of four. I also have a Gusto subscription. Um, I spend quite a lot of money on food, okay? I'm also thinking of buying an electric car and I've made no secret of the fact digitally because I spend hours and hours on YouTube watching reviews of different electric cars. But the number of advertisements I see either for food or consumer packaged goods or for electric cars is more or less zero. By contrast, about a year ago, I got grumpy buying my daughter's replacement tights. And I read an article where, in which a nurse explained that although she was a nurse and not hugely wealthy, she always bought kind of Walford or Fogel or high-end tights because they actually paid for themselves because they last much, lasted much longer. So I thought, okay, let's do an experiment. I'm sick of buying these damn things. Let's go and buy a pair of these things online and see if it works. And to be honest, jury's still out, but I think the nurse is probably right. But then for about the next four months, I saw advertisements for almost nothing else. What's going on here? Now, Walford or Fogel or whoever it is who's selling the tights is being individually rational because they are simply adopting an approach where as long as money spent uh, is less than revenue and profits generated, margin generated, it makes sense for them to advertise digitally. But here's the thing, OK, unlike Unilever, unlike P&G, unlike the manufacturers of electric cars, OK, they have a few qualities which are it's a direct purchase of insanely high margin. I can't even begin to imagine what the margin on those things must be, because if you're in the high-end hosiery market, they probably cost 50% more to manufacture, but you charge about seven times as much per pair. Okay, so the margins are insane. You sell direct, it's extremely attributable, and also it's regularly, I would guess, an impulse buy. So the financial gains to advertising are particularly colossal. Unilever has none of that. It's not an impulse buy. It's not very easily attributable. Very few people are buying direct from you. They're buying through intermediaries. And so as a result, making the purely rational case for advertising consumer packaged goods online is much, much weaker. The actual value of the activity may be higher, but the measured value is much, much lower. And as a result, we have a case where lots and lots of people, it's kind of tragedy of the commons, lots and lots of people are rationally advertising in digital media. 
But if digital media were collectively rational at scale, there would be some reasonable correlation between where I spend my money and what I see on the screen. And there isn't any at all. What I see on the screen bears no relation to where the contents of my wallet end up being spent. Now, if you take this as a collective level, this is an enormous economic failure. It is genuinely a tragedy of the commons because you will have advertising attention dominated by a peculiar subcategory of very, very high margin, perhaps impulse goods that are sold directly at the expense of everything else. I mean, if advertising were more powerful than it were, it would lead to insane economic distortions of the economy where 30% of discretionary income uh, was spent on financial services products and high-end hosiery and nobody actually bought a car. And so I think this is just a really important question because I think Elizabeth mentioned this brilliantly and so did, um, uh, so did Martin, actually. I couldn't have asked for two uh, better um, uh, forerunners for my talk. Because the whole business is focused around efficiency. And it's treating marketing as though it's a high school maths problem, because that looks scientific. And if, you, if your decision making appears scientific, you never get blamed for it. And this is the problem I'd like to talk about, which is J John Cleese at Nudgestock spoke about this. The typical high school maths problem is two buses leave a bus station at noon, one travels due north at a constant 40 kilometers an hour, one travels due west at a constant 30 kilometers an hour. What time will it be when they are 100 kilometers apart? Okay, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon is the correct answer. There's a single correct answer. Okay, and freakishly, the question setter has presented you with all the data you need to solve the problem to arrive at a single demonstrably right answer okay based on some fairly obviously stupid decisions buses never travel in a straight line they get stuck in traffic and they don't leave on time but discarding all the complexities of real life we can arrive at what appears to be a right answer now i would argue that taking that approach when you're doing digital optimization is a fatal mistake because you don't know everything you need to make a decision. And this is the vital point. You simply don't know enough you, uh, uh, to make a decision and the information you do have is highly unrepresentative. So even something as apparently reliable as a transaction is a very, very unreliable guide to the value of, of, uh, of, of a, uh, a piece of persuasion. I'll give you an example of this, okay? The job of marketing, fairly basically, is to get people, and this is why I think Martin's point about reach was so important. You don't know who wants your product and you never will, okay? Forget about it, okay? It doesn't matter how much data you have, there are going to be a huge number of tacit, unspoken, unknown factors which lead to people needing your product, which you will never be able to predict. What you can predict is that they've never heard of the damn thing. They're probably not gonna buy it, search for it or engage with it. A huge part of advertising, therefore, is not actually harvesting existing demand. It's opportunistic. It's a process of discovery, not a process of uh, essentially uh, optimizing on past knowledge. And if you only optimize on past knowledge, as bees have discovered, you end up, you never get lucky and you end up starving to death. 20% of bees ignore the waggle dance. They don't actually take any uh, heed of the information displayed by the bees on the walls of the hive as to where there is currently pollen and nectar to be found. And for a long time, this completely baffled bee scientists who thought that it's about time that bee compliance officers arose, who kind of enforced greater uh, compliance with the waggle dance to bring our nectar collection target in line with our quarter three forecast. Okay, And they were baffled by the fact that after 20 million years of bee evolution, bees seemed surprisingly inefficient in their use of the waggle dance. And then they modeled it as a complex system and they realized two things. One, if you become overly dependent on what you already know and the environment changes, some cows break into a field and eat all the, uh, eat all the flowers, you don't know where to go next, okay? So you've become overly optimized on what you know compared to discovering what you don't yet know or discovering what, what is true tomorrow that wasn't true yesterday. All big data comes from the same place. It comes from the past, okay? During the coronavirus crisis, all the world's airlines turned off their pricing algorithms and had to start pricing flights manually. Why? Because everything they'd learned in the previous 10 years about airline pricing was suddenly rendered irrelevant. 
because previously, if you dropped the price of a flight, it encouraged people to board a plane. People would pay almost anything to get on a plane, and the other 90% wouldn't board a plane at gunpoint, okay? So using the same assumptions that were proven and optimized in the past and applying them to a different future simply didn't work. And so this optimization problem is fundamentally problematic because the job of marketing is to get people who weren't going to buy the product to buy it at full price. And the job of performance marketing, if we're not careful, is to get people who would have bought the product anyway to buy it a bit sooner at a discount. Now, I'm not disputing that, by the way. It's a valuable function of advertising, overcoming inertia, bringing sales forward. It's a perfectly worthwhile role of advertising, but it's part of it. It's not the whole game. This is what Mark Ritson means when he talks about bothism. It's not a question of the fact that people who are devotees of mass marketing and mass media are hostile to what's happening in digital. The optimization at the bottom of the funnel, I would argue, is the thing you should do first. Because there's no point in doing great work further up the funnel if there's a bottleneck lower down. There's no point in widening a road if there's a badly sequenced set of traffic lights 100 yards further on. Okay, I agree. I think it's really important. Do it first. Optimize your last mile conversion. But that's not the whole game. Because as I said, you know, performance marketing arguably finds customers. Great creative work creates them. A brilliant message which you will probably discover through experimentation as much as through anything else, as much as through prediction, a really, really potent creative message creates customers out of nowhere. And that resulting transaction is more valuable than bringing an existing customer purchase forward a bit. You've probably heard the famous story about the pizza restaurant where they send people out with 20% off vouchers into the streets. And they convert at sort of three, four, seven, six percent depending on the wait staff member who's handing out these flyers to passes by on the street. And then there's this one guy who converts at 100%. And he said, yeah, I didn't have time to go out earlier, so I just went to the queue outside the restaurant and handed everybody a voucher. If we're not careful, we'll end up optimizing for the wrong things. Efficiency only correlates well with effectiveness if you know absolutely everything you need to know uh, already. And in the real world, we never do. And that's a vital thing to understand. I'm going to end, I, I think it's, it's really, really important because it terrifies me the extent to which I think what we're trying to sell here is a delusion. And what we're trying to sell is human-free, creativity-free, hypothesis-free decision-making. So the fantasy that tech firms sell, I think in collusion with media companies and, uh, uh, and to be honest, uh, you know, a, a, a bunch of financially minded people in the business sector, is the idea that if only you know enough, then human agency is no longer necessary in decision making. The decisions take themselves. That is true in an incredibly limited set of circumstances. It requires extraordinarily stable equilibrium. Uh, it requires effectively absolutely complete information about what's happening to an extent which is always impossible. Okay, and it's never going to happen. And what I think is happening here is a fundamental misunderstanding about what science is. I'm going to end on this because I'm probably running out of time a little bit. I'm going to end on this, okay. One of the greatest minds of the 19th century nobody's ever heard of. He's a guy called um, Charles Sanders Peirce. It's spelled P-E-I-R-C-E. -E. -E. He's an American logician. And he made the point that most scientific progress, most discovery, most advances are not made by deduction or induction, which is taking what you know and making logical inferences from what you already know. His argument was that most science, I think, I think actually history bears this out, is what's called abductive inference. Now, abductive inference is perhaps one of two processes. It's working backwards from a, from a a, a, an existing anomaly. That's Darwin, okay? All these finches have different shaped beaks. This is unusual and strange. What would have to be true in order for this to pertain? And that requires an act of imagination and it requires a hypothesis. Fleming, all these bacteria seem to have died. You wouldn't expect that. What would need to have happened? Uh, those of you who've been watching um, a series of programs on the West Cork murder, okay, detective work is effectively abductive inference. Something strange has happened, and now I have to consider what the pre-existing conditions might have been in order to lead to this. 
it's impossible to do without some imaginative leap. Okay. And what we do in marketing is arguably, I would, I believe the future can look like this rather than that. What would need to happen in order for this future to emerge? It's the same thing, but it's, if you like, done as a forecast rather than, if, you, if you're a fan of detective fiction, this is what Conan Doyle called uh, reverse, uh, effectively, uh, it, it, it's reverse rationality. It's actually thinking backwards. We as humans are very, very good at what will happen next. We're not so good at actually doing it backwards. Reasoning backwards is what Conan Doyle called it. And I think there's a fundamental problem here because what a bunch of people are trying to do is they're trying to create creativity-free progress. And if you accept Peirce's argument that actually most progress is abductive inference, it requires some sort of leap, we're never going to get there if we're obsessed with this reductionist approach to marketing. It's a fundamentally self-limiting rule. And I think what we have, by the way, I'm gonna end on this, is we've created a monster for ourselves in business because we've created these departments like finance and procurement, which are highly asymmetrical. Because what they can do, okay, is they can take credit for cut costs without ever being held responsible for missed opportunities. Now, the reason the bees are inefficient, the reason the bees fly around at random, they, they don't all obey the waggle dance, is for two reasons. It's to make the hive more resilient, so it knows of more sources of profitable revenue, or nectar, as they call it in the bee world, okay? And it's also for the chance of getting lucky. It's an inefficient process looked at at the level of the individual bee journey, OK, if you look at it at a small scale, it's irrational. If you look at it in the context of a hive as a complex system, it's actually necessary and essential. It diversifies the hive's knowledge. It builds on new knowledge. It accepts the fact that the environment is changing. Those of you who watch Clarkson's Farm, I think, have had a free MBA from watching that brilliant program. But what we've created is these very powerful entities which can look at the individual bee journey and say, well, last time you end off, you didn't find any nectar. You're fucking useless. Right, out. OK. And that's because finance and procurement can take the credit from cost savings, but they're never held accountable for missed opportunities because missed opportunities are less salient and less quantifiable than immediate cost savings. And until we actually fight back as marketers and rebalance business, in terms of the ratio of opportunity seeking versus exploitation. The ratio of the money you spend on explore and the money you spend on exploit, until we can get that ratio more healthily balanced, okay, uh, then there's no hope for any of us. So sorry, that is the vital question, which is when you look at things at a small scale, many, many things look irrational at the micro level or at the short-term level, which are highly rational, at scale and over time, okay? The reverse is also true. Unless we understand this and stop trying to optimize a business as a system by optimizing the individual component parts, we're gonna do the worst thing possible. And this is Peter Drucker, what a perfect quote to end on, okay? There's nothing worse than seeing a business pursuing efficiently an end which it shouldn't be pursuing at all. And that's misdirected effort and it's doubly tragic. It's costly, but in many cases, it's actually counterproductive. Thanks very much. Now, don't go anywhere, Rory, because uh, we have some questions from the floor. But before we, had, we take that, I mean, we've got a lot of marketers and creatives sitting here, and your message is going to resonate with a lot of them. Mm. But they're all, they're all charged with, don't come here and tell me about anything unexpected. We don't want anything, anything unexpected. We want the expected. That's the message that they get from finance and the board. That's what they're charged with. What advice do you have working within Ogilvy of practically how to start these discussions with people who are bean counters? How do you do it? The first thing we've lost, I think, is the word creativity is a bit of a disaster because most people outside our field associate it with music and painting, okay? They see it as an arty, uh, what you might call the last phase on a journey. I think creativity is like a vaccine. You need more than one dose. And the biggest application of creativity actually is in defining problems, uh, not necessarily in solving them. Because if you can define a problem in a different way, at a different scale, 
uh, about 80% of the time, the solution falls out naturally. Good mathematicians understand this. But the other thing we have to sell is this idea that you can actually, uh, that creativity is a cost, is catastrophic. And this culture I think we've created where your career is best served by following the waggle dance all the time, has created a massive asymmetry in business decision making. Uh, you know, you see it in the, you, know, you get a lot of CEOs who are ex-CFOs. The shareholder value movement has been a bit of a catastrophe, I think, in that way as well, um, because most of a CEO's activity is effectively focused around financial reporting. And the truth of the matter is that those things which the digital world should have been a playground for massive experimentation. And once or twice, we've been allowed to use it this way. KFC in Australia, you know, fries for a dollar, chips for a dollar, as they call it in Australia, okay, where the most potent advertisement was completely counterproductive. It was maximum four per customer, okay? It was a legal line writ large. And behavioral science can both um, effectively spur and also explain these counterintuitive creative findings. But I think, um, you know, we, 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 when we're allowed to experiment, we always find something remarkable. And my great, my great argument for behavioral science and creativity is its job isn't only to solve problems, it's to expand the solution space. But the kind of finance people who are in control in business don't actually want the solution space expanded because it makes problem solving more subjective and more difficult. They prefer to treat it as a two body problem, reduce it to three variables and, opto and solve for X. OK, and so the real messiness of life, which actually has scope for this most billion dollar companies, Red Bull, Dyson, Nespresso, OK, um, five guys. OK, they came about because someone, some rogue bee discovered some nectar where no one thought they'd find it. And yes, there's a higher failure rate in that kind of activity. And so there should be, by the way, because if you're not failing at some sensible level, you're not being experimental enough. But the other problem with rationality, by the way, is it makes businesses more and more alike. And, you know, the greatest source of value is not, not necessarily differentiation, you know, it's not necessarily differentiation, but distinctiveness is absolutely essential to uh, being a profitable entity. Some form of distinctiveness whether it's kind of visual, tonal, uh, whatever, is absolutely essential to, uh, to the creation of value. Otherwise, business just becomes a race to the bottom. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. We have actually got another question that's come in. If you are struggling to kind of get these sorts of messages across in your own business, I do think that the presentation we had earlier from Jim Shark, Noel Mack, where he talked about his rate of failure. You know, Jim Shark, they're out there, they're pushing the boundaries, um, and, and, you know, the, the, he talked about his failure rate. Yes, they have their viral successes, but there's a lot of stuff going on that doesn't work, and they're comfortable with that. That's the kind of presentation that you need to be putting in front of some of the decision makers in your business. Because when they say to you, go viral, uh, but don't fail, uh, and make sure it's different from everyone else, but don't try anything <laughs> different, I think that is exactly the kind of content that you need to be showing them. Um, I'm hoping now that we can um, go to a question that we have through the app from someone called Emily. Emily, if you're in the room, stand up uh, and give, give us a wave. Hi, Emily. Thank you for, for posting this question. Emily's question is uh, behind me. It says, uh, Rory, if technology is really just an extension of humanity, why is it sucking all the humanity and creativity out of marketing? Uh, I would answer that. I, I, I've always mentioned the fact that there's an asymmetry in business, which is that creative people always have to present their ideas to rational people, but it never happens the other way around. OK, I call, you know, that if you come up with a creative, counterintuitive, unexpected idea, you have to go to a load of people who will do a feasibility study and a cost benefit analysis and so forth. OK, but it never happens the other way around. You never get a bunch of rational people going, well, according to our model, the answer is 3.5. But before I present it to the board, I'll go and consult some really wacky people to see if they've got a different way of looking at this. Matthew Syed's writings, by the way, like Rebel Ideas, is really important in this, that different frames of reference, different perspectives are extraordinarily liberating. And yet the rational crowd don't feel any need for them because rather like AI, um, they only know what they know. And they're not particularly hungry for disruptive ideas from elsewhere. And I can see us, by the way, this is a much more important philosophical question. So 
Everybody knows that pain in the ass when you go to a website and you really need to phone up because the answer isn't on the website and you know because you look for 10 minutes, but they bury the phone number. Okay. Now, the correct use, I think, of digitalization of customer service would have been if you're a credit card company, okay, we don't need to pay humans to answer banal questions like what's my balance or um, have you received my check, except for a small niche of the market, which may be elderly or Luddite or whatever. Okay, so we can save some money. Absolutely true. And they, they thought, that's great. We've saved some money because we've got all our customers self-serving. Okay. Now, one, I might argue that self-service is a benefit when it's one, two, or three utilities. I don't know if anybody else finds this. When you've got to log in three times a day to, to look at your gas bill, it actually becomes a, a pain in the ass. When you scale that practice up, it goes from being a benefit to being a consumer pain. And that's an important distinction. But regardless of that, what they never asked is the second question, which is, OK, but the questions we will receive from people who can't find the answer online are now going to be slightly more complicated. So the remaining people we have, we need to skill them up, we need to pay them more, and we need to make sure they stay around for longer and become expert. OK, because there's a lot of tacit knowledge. Those of you who watch Clarkson's Farm, Caleb is the embodiment of tacit knowledge. He has no theoretical knowledge whatsoever, but his instinctive knowledge is absolutely priceless. Okay, sorry, sorry to keep burbing on about Clarkson Farm, but it is a free Harvard MBA if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber. So it is really that valuable. But what we'll do with telemedicine is the accountants will take over and some of it will benefit people because you know, I no longer have to wait in a waiting room with a lot of ill people in order to renew a prescription or perform some fairly banal action, uh, you know, or to be given, you know, some fairly obvious medication or some advice. I mean, you know, 50 percent of visits to the doctor are probably solved by the doctor going, there's a lot of it about. OK, because that's reassurance. It's not actually a cure, but it's reassurance. Doctors are as much in the reassurance business as they are in the medical business. It's like that business when you have a power cut, all the lights go out at home. What do you do? You go out in the street, and if everybody else's lights are out, you go, phew, I can relax. It's a collective problem, okay? If it's just your house, you start panicking. The worst thing a doctor can say to you is, I've never seen anything like this ever before, right? That's what you don't want to hear. There's a lot of it about is basically reassurance. And you can deliver that in many cases, I think, online. But the corresponding part, the finance people aren't going to be so keen on, which is you now maybe need to extend the typical doctor's appointment, the GP's appointment needs to go from 10 minutes to 17. And if the person comes into the GP and you haven't actually seen him physically for the previous six years, maybe you need to get a phlebotomist involved and have a look at, you know, what ails him, right? So the correct right-sizing thing is a trade-off between the shareholder interest and the customer interest, which can lead to a new equilibrium, which is better than the old one. But instead, what everybody tries to do is they try to take the cost savings, okay, and, and throw away the areas where they, and disc I think management consultancy is largely a business where you come in and you take credit for visible reductions in cost and then walk away, never having any skin in the blame to suffer from the lost opportunities or unintended consequences of those short term gains. I think it's an inherently dishonest business. Well, we look forward to the next book on the arse covering um, in management consultancy. Mm. Yes, the art of arse covering. Um, can I just suggest everyone that you give a massive round of applause to Rory? Um, what a fantastic presentation. I mean, really, really brilliant. And I have, I, I've never seen anything like that before, except for the last time that Rory presented. So thank you, Rory.